Our next uh, speaker has informed me that there are some uh, three million wrecks on the ocean floor and only a tiny fraction of those have been explored. So I'd like to invite James Delgado up here. He's a marine historian and he has a lot to tell us about the hidden secrets under the water. I grew up listening to these words on television, and it inspired me. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise, her ongoing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. I loved it, absolutely loved it, Little did I realize that I would have a chance to explore the final frontier. Not there, but there. The ocean is the most dominant feature of this planet. It is the engine that drives our weather. It is the source of much of the oxygen we breathe. It is the source of over half the world's food. It is the highway by which we continue to trade. More than 90% of the world's goods continue to move on water in containers and it is also the greatest museum that we have on the planet. It has been mysterious to us until we began to venture beneath it, from the mythical tale of Alexander taking a glass diving bell, to those who with diving bells sought to recover the riches lost at sea, to the invention of hard hat diving dress in the early 19th century, to scuba, to now, where increasingly, not only in scuba, but with robotic vehicles, we are journeying into those depths. Archaeologists arrived somewhat late onto the scene. We began our work there in 1960, when George Bass of the University of Pennsylvania conducted the first scientific excavation of an ancient shipwreck from the Bronze Age, a site known as Geladonia in Turkey, 2,900 years old. Alas, no tablets, but an amazing array of artifacts which led to more excavations, a wreck at another site in Turkey called Ulaburun, 3,300 years old. And in that, the demonstration, not only could we go and find things, but by applying science, we could learn more about what was there. We could learn about ancient civilizations. We could learn about how clever and how stupid we are as human beings. Ever since those initial beginnings, Excavations like that at Ulaburun and Geladonia have taught us much about the past in addition to that which we excavate on land. Ulaburun, 12 separate ancient cultures trading and interacting with each other, a global market, if you will. Excavations of the Spanish Armada some 500 years ago. Archaeologist Colin J. M. Martin has found amazing disparities that speak to some of the key questions as to why the Spanish lost and how the English won. And in particular, fascinating, is the realization that in excavating the Spanish ships, he's finding beautifully wrought guns, but each one of them individual with its own cannonball made specifically for it. One of the reasons why, he figures, the English were firing every couple of minutes, and it took the Spaniards up to an hour to return a shot, because at each step of the way, with a huge pile of cannonballs, you're taking a gun scale and going, yep, no, no, no. <laughs> No, okay, load, fire. <laughs> All of their instruments have fundamental math errors, and what Colin traces this to is the fact that just about eight decades previous, Ferdinand and Isabella, while they were busy launching the venture to the New World, also decided to embrace the Inquisition. They decided to make a number of people in Spain no longer welcome, particularly the learned classes, Muslims and Jews. And if you didn't convert, you left. So Spain suffered an incredible brain drain, says Colin Martin, and it shows up 80 years later with them win losing the battle and losing the war with England because they didn't understand math. Gotta love it. Archaeology teaching us and informing us. As we have worked through the years, as we have continued to map, we have started search by, first by stretching tapes, taking photographs, pasting them together, but increasingly, as we continued our work, we ventured into the deep ocean. The thought that in the deep ocean more wrecks would be found had been the dream of many, 
But it wasn't until 1985 when Jean-Louis Michel of Francis Ephraimer and Robert Ballard of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution found Titanic. With Titanic came the realization that thanks to Cold War technologies being applied, we could now venture to the very limits and beyond. We could find anything, seemingly, and with that as well, other technologies that came to the fore, GPS, which enabled us to not only go out into the ocean, but know where we were. The idea of ocean ships now, whether they were private sector or government, being able to go out and systematically begin to search the oceans, in their own way, little starship enterprises. Linked not only by navigation to satellites, but ultimately, as we'll see, thanks to the magic of satellites and the collection of that, dare I say it, big data, an opportunity to venture into the final frontier. The other tools that we developed as well, sonar developed by Marty Klein and others, enabled us to start taking pictures at the bottom of the ocean where you can't see your hand in front of your face. Full confession, I learned to dive many years ago in San Francisco Bay. San Francisco Bay is cold and dark. In fact, when people say, what diving school do you go to? I usually say, the Helen Keller School of Diving. <laughs> in order to see where the eye can't, we're developing new cameras and systems, but we use sonar. And sonar has gotten so precise and so amazing that you can take pictures like this with sound not only with side-scanning sonar, but with multi-beam sonar that enable us to continue to map the seabed and to go where no one has gone before. <coughs> Moses pointed it out. 74% of the planet covered by water, and of all of that, we empirically know about 5%. And when I say we know it, that's because we've taken a picture at the bottom of the ocean. The other night at the party, somebody asked, well, how is it when you guys are constantly surveying with us, how is it that you're not just as you mow the lawn finding it all? Well, the simple answer is that in many cases, when we look at all of this data, we're drawing a line with sound across the bottom of the ocean. But that line, if you take it and pose it on the map of, say, modern Toronto today, in some cases you zoom into it, and what you see is that the sonar line is basically Bloor Street connecting with Young, and everything else is blank. As well, when you mount a sonar on the hull of a ship, and it's not the depth, say, of from there to here, when you're going down a thousand or more meters, there's something called pixelation. And so even though we'll get nice sound pictures, to get something like this, you've got to get in close. When you're up high, the basic pixel up high is basically the size of this room. So imagine trying to find something small in there, whether it's a canyon, whether it's new life, whether it's an old shipwreck. So with that, we've begun to develop new technologies. Robots like the Remus, an autonomous underwater vehicle. Programmed, it goes out. This specific type goes to 6,000 meters, hence the name Remus 6000. It can work for 20 hours. It can systematically go, cover a fair amount of seabed, flying low, flying high, adjusting in case there's something to run into it, or it should run into that, I should say, and collecting a variety of data, temperature, the amount of oxygen in the water. It's a probe, just like Spock used to fire out of the Enterprise. <laughs> and with that, what we capture and bring back is amazing imagery that we can then send tethered robots down to look at. And what I like most about it, as the father of one-time teenagers, is if this thing surfaces and you're not there, it phones you. <laughs> in 2010, I was chief scientist on the last mission to Titanic. And with that, here's 24 square kilometers, narrowed down with the big pixel, down to the closer stuff with the AUV. That's a box in which Titanic rests. And in there, zooming in, there's the main portion of Titanic's wreck, the bow and the stern separated by about 800 yards or meters. In that area, zooming in with the sound again, able to get closer, that's the stern of Titanic painted entirely with sound. Now that's the basic map done with the robot again and again. And then with the remotely operated vehicle, Thanks to the magic of colleagues at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, superimposing visual data that maps. And there's that same stern of Titanic, everything there, the railing down, you can't see where Jack and Rose clung on to the very end. <laughs> but there it is, captured 12,456 feet below the surface <clears throat> in detail. Here's Titanic. <clears throat> 
bow and stern, imaged and pulled together. This is Titanic as well, not a painting, but Titanic imaged with the robots back and forth. All of this done and to this level of accuracy. So we've got the tools. We're able to do it, but what's missing? What's missing has been doing this for more than just, well, self-satisfying archaeological reasons, not just doing it because it's cool, not just doing it because it's old, not just doing it because we can, but doing it because there's something that we need to address in this planet right now, and that is that the oceans are not only key to our understanding of the past, the oceans are key to our future. So these days, I work in the States for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I'm not here representing them today. I'm on my holiday back home in Canada. But they tolerate what I do. Because what we focus back on is through finds like these, we connect people to the oceans. How? Well, when we find something like this wreck in 1,300 meters of water in the Gulf of Mexico, an unanticipated discovery of a copper-clad ghost of a shipwreck filled with an amazing array of artifacts that we now know dates to the early part of the 19th century, a period of fast change, the fall of empires, the rise of new countries, and this ship most likely being a privateer, a legalized pirate with two other vessels. We went back, working with Bob Ballard of Titanic fame and his ship, the Nautilus, to explore this wreck and to not only map it, but to also excavate and recover 63 artifacts to biopsy the wreck, if you will, so we could learn more. But in doing this, the key, the way it works best is that Bob's team is diverse. You have a number of folks on the ship, archaeologists and other scientists. But here, for any of you who ever gave anybody a hard time over video games, the best ROV pilots are the gamers. And as well, all of the other engineers. And what's also fun is that with that whole team working together, you can only fit so many of them on the ship. But thanks to those satellites, thanks to the connection, thanks to telepresence, we can connect to other scientists around the world. So as much as we had a small team of us on the ship, we also had a few hundred other colleagues who could chime in, could say, no, I see exactly what that is. But what's also important is when the Enterprise went and visited a new planet, it wasn't just looking at the ancient ruins. It was looking at everything. And thanks to telepresence and thanks to the need to connect, we share this with scientists who, at the moment, we are excavating and looking and recovering something like a jar of ginger, which helped sailors not have seasickness. The marine biologists are looking and studying. The physical oceanographers are there looking at the readouts. They're looking at how much dissolved oxygen. We're taking probes and sticking them in to see the formation of bacteria. We're looking at how the copper is degrading and killing marine life as the wreck itself has become an artificial reef. But the key as well is, as we did this, as we recovered these few things, and brought them back for more analysis, we also were sharing this with the rest of the planet. We melted Bob's server that day as we started the work, because in a moment we had a little better at that stage, about 1.1 million people tune in and watch. Not just look over our shoulder, but ask questions. Now, we don't have that technology down now, and there's a, it's hard to sort of deal with the flow. But just the same, whether it was a school group, an audience like you in an, in an auditorium, or people sitting and watching this on their phones, their iPads, or at their desk, we were fielding all sorts of questions and comments, and that was magic. Because with that, a couple of things. Not only do you get the opportunity to then interpret and to share, but what you also have the opportunity to do is learn from others. It's citizen science. It's answering questions. And for me as an archaeologist, one of the magic questions, one of the best is in the middle of trying to pick something up very carefully, somebody finally said, stop pussyfooting around, pick it up! <laughs> to which you stop for a second, look up and say, hey, I hear you. And actually, full disclosure, I'm one of the least patient archaeologists on the planet, but I have one chance only to do this and not break it. So I had a chance to explain a little bit of what I do, but also learn from the other folks who would say, by the way, you just missed that, or I, I've been studying these and this is what I know. And to have the biologists chime in, we found three new species of life while we were down there. We found things living there that shouldn't have been living there that we knew lived elsewhere. 
It's a whole range of papers. There's a couple dissertations that are already being done on it, but the key thing is that people watched. Now, when we work on Titanic or other sites, then what we do is we bring all of that science together, but we also talk about the issues. In every one of these wrecks, we find problems. We find modern trash. We find that wrecks have an impact. Just two weeks ago, off the coast of British Columbia, in our first mission in Canada with Nautilus, we were able to go out and find this wreck, the Coast Trader, torpedoed by the Japanese in World War II, June 7, 1942, sitting on the bottom. Canadian Hydrographic had mapped something that we thought was it, about two miles away from where the crew said they'd been sunk. But these were the first eyes to drop down, and a lot of folks watched it. Hopefully some of you were able to join us and watch. We're still trying to get better about just saying, hi, we're out there. And to that end, if you go to nautilus.org now, live missions are happening as Bob and the team go all the way down the west coast of North America, looking at fish, looking at reefs, looking at submerged prehistoric shorelines that may give evidence of the first people on this continent, and as well, the past. The messages that we share, I think, ultimately boil down to this. The final frontier is there. It's in your own backyard, and you can be part of it. If you're young, there's plenty left to do. If you're a kid, not all has been done. The boomers have left a lot for you. And it doesn't matter what your passion is, it doesn't matter what you want to focus on. If you are into robotics, if you're into telepresence, if you are into biology, if you're into archaeology, there's a place for you. You can boldly go where no one's gone before. You can seek out new life. You can find evidence of past civilizations. And you don't need to join Starfleet. It's important that we keep our eyes focused above, but it's also important that we keep them focused there. In addition to this great museum at the bottom of the sea is a very fragile part of this planet which is in trouble. Acid acidification is killing coral. We are overfishing. We are dumping garbage into the oceans, and they are in trouble. Sea level rise is going to drown portions of our coasts, and ultimately, we need to find new solutions. It's absolutely key, and the best way to do it is to go join us, join the Corps of Exploration, boldly go, and make a difference. Thank you.